This is BBC Two. Lawrence Durrell, the author of the Alexandria Quartet and several Greek island books, is 70 this year. To mark this occasion, we are now showing two highly acclaimed programmes which trace much of his life. This evening's is Lawrence Durrell's Greece. In 1975, Peter Adam took Durrell back to the places of his most famous travel books, Prospero's Cell and Marine Venus. <laughs> The Greece that I knew as a young and aggressive poet has changed. Nevertheless, I feel there might be some point in trying to recollect and perhaps recreate a little, a little bit of the Greece which is not finished yet and not gone for good, and whose ghost still rises up to afflict me from time to time. And you don't have to dig very far to find real bone structure, so that it really is possible to disinter the Greece I knew as a boy of 23 uh, as effectively as the archaeologists have disinterred long lost civilizations. And it's with the same joy and pleasure one always finds oneself mentally doing precisely that. It was in 1935 that Lawrence Dowell went to Corfu. This marked the beginning of a lifelong relationship between a writer and his Mediterranean landscape. Dowell described the enchantment of his four Corfu years in his first island book, Prosperous Cell. Somewhere between Calabria and Corfu, the blue really begins. You feel the horizon beginning to stain at the rim. The sky seems to come a little nearer and into deeper focus and you're aware of islands coming out of the darkness to meet you, aware not so much of a landscape coming invisibly over those blue miles of water as of a climate. Entering Greece is like entering a dark crystal. The form of things becomes irregular, refracted. Mirages suddenly swallow islands, and if you watch, you can see the trembling curtain of the atmosphere. Corfu is a sort of anteroom to Aegean Greece, a landscape lying up close against the sky, suspended on the blue lion pads of mountains. The town is all Venetian blue and gold and utterly spoiled by the sun. Its richness cloys and enervates. And across the rich screen of this landscape, many names, ancient and modern, offer themselves. It's supposed to be Prospero's Island and the Tempest might be as good a guide to Corfu as the official one. The petrified rock of Mouse Island, whose romance of line and form defies paint and lens, as well as the feebler word, is said to be the boat turned to stone as a punishment for taking Ulysses home.
Xenophon, writing of the Spartan invasion under Nesippus, records a paradise of fertility and cultivation, a paradise so rich in loot that it unmanned the invaders. Then in the 14th century, the island was given to the Venetians and stood as a boundary stone when the waves of the invading east burst into these green valleys and groves. Under Venice, she prospered, at least in forests, for the Venetians gave 10 gold pieces for every grove of 100 olive trees planted. Until when they left, it is said the island possessed nearly 2 million trees. Then in the 19th century, the French came and burnt the Golden Book, in which the names of the Venetian families were inscribed, and the aristocracy died in the flames, to be reborn, phoenix-like, in titles stiff and unreal as old brocade. For the British who followed did their best to reinstate the aristocratic tradition. Everything absurd, everything tragic, and everything gay has happened here. It's been a dowry for kings. Idiots like uh, Bonaparte decided to land on the fort and then didn't. Uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon passed on the way to Cyprus. I'm quite sure that it is Prospero's island in the sense that everyone falls asleep. The enchantment in Prospero is very Corfu. For example, the French came here and they decided it was so nice. They'd like to do the Rue de Rivoli. They did half of it, they fell asleep and left. The British decided it's so nice, it ought to be administered. They built a lovely government house. They brought the stone from Malta. Good architecture for once. British colonies aren't all like that. They fell asleep and left. Cricket lives on as independently as the patron saint does. It's a mysterious and satisfying ritual which the islands have refused to relinquish. To the Greek peasant's eye, the white-clothed players must seem like something off a Cretan vase. Soon after Darrell and his young wife had settled down in a house in the hills, his mother and the rest of the family followed. We needed sun, we needed sunlight and to swim, because after all we were colonials, you see. We'd been brought up in India in the sun, and that was really a, like a, a lack of iodine in the blood. And so we stuck a pin in the map, and Greece was then so much far the cheapest country in Europe. And in fact, we'd live awfully comfortably here for nothing. In those days, you got about a hundred pounds advance for a book, which would give you something like six months freedom in Corfu, eating well and drinking well. I mean, on this terrace here, my mother potted up and down, uh, clucking like a hen, and worrying about domestic problems. Uh, it's terribly recent, our prosperity. I mean, I'm talking about, what, 1936, 37, 35 years ago, 30 years ago. The primus stove was the only source of heat we had, and it could boil a kettle in about four minutes, but it was dangerous, it often blew up. For the most part, you used charcoal, and it took 25 minutes to, to boil water. Everything was stretched out much more leisurely, and if you didn't have the means to make big wood fires and use them in your, in your kitchen arrangements, you went round to the, where they made bread, and for a penny, you could put your lunch into the baker's oven and go and withdraw it at one o'clock at lunchtime. The 
primitiveness had also the kind of simplicity which was the really poetic stuff. You began to taste your olive oil, you began to taste your bread, because it was being manufactured in front of you instead of Hovey's whole meal, which comes anonymously onto your plate in a big capital like, like Paris or like London, where you never somehow see a loaf being baked or being eaten by a child, half eaten before it gets home. But it proved other things uh, for me. It proved that you don't need a lot of clobber to live, that you can live with one knife, one fork, one teaspoon and one glass. And quite a lot of you can live like that. So you learn to live very frugally and very sparely. Um, important lesson, really. In the old days, special wells had uh, a sort of uh, special qualities. I mean, elderly people had a well that they preferred to another well, you know, rather like wine tasters. The notion of water becomes so terribly important because you're always half dying of thirst in this wonderful heat. You're not sweating very much in some curious way. You're dying of thirst all the time. And cool water, cold water, water of any kind, is absolutely one of the elements. You begin to feel its ancient Greek connotation. Greece hits you with its long associations with the past. It reverberates like a, like a seashell the whole time. Identical islands uh, off Dubrovnik, for example, just as beautiful, they seem to hold nothing. The, um, the sort of flower bed of ancient Greek mythology is always at your elbow here. Um, it's a, great, it's a great seduction because you really do feel the presence of Aphrodite and the spirit of place. It's not sentimental to realize that out of every phrase that they use today, two out of five words are Homeric words. Uh, they come from Plato. One feels that, that life is capable of, of much more extension here than in big cities. I don't know how it is. As if, so to speak, we all had hundreds of lives to live and we only managed to arrange to live about three or four. There is either not time or there's not circumstance. But here you feel the possibility of, of living the maximum number of lives allotted to you, so to speak. The cat. Well, the people struck me as so fantastic. Um, a sort of as if Ireland had been towed down and plunked into the Mediterranean. Because it, it isn't Spanish, you know, which has a sort of somber quality, and it isn't Italy, which has an operatic quality. Uh, it has kind of innocent, wide eyed, uh, passionate, romantic craziness, uh, which went right to my heart. <laughs> Yeah.
every occasion was an excuse for a celebration, and of course, weddings topped the lot, involving ceremony and glad rags and great revelry and dancing all night. In the old island costume, the villagers looked as colorful as a pack of cards. most galloping dancer was the giver away, it's the best man, and he has the best look in of all. He walks out with the bride on his arm and then the bride is taken away and then a festive dance is arranged. It's all very Homeric. They themselves are not aware sometimes of the, of the uh, ancientness of their, of their customs. Um, but they are there as they go back through Byzance into, well, into really, to ancient life. Dancing is never a performance so much as a communal rite, the transmission of an enigmatic knowledge which the musician has summoned up from below the earth. It flows outward through the dancing feet, which are building the dusty circle, stitch by stitch, like a fabric being woven, step by step, like a city being built. And the darker circle outside, the lookers-on, gradually absorbs the rhythm, which triumphs over them by sheer repetition being laid down in the consciousness like successive coats of a thrilling color. One can watch the crowd being drawn into such a dance, man by man, impelled by something like the gravitational law which decrees that autumn windfall should plunge towards the center of the earth when they are ripe. Human beings are expressions of their landscape, but in order to touch the secret springs of a national essence, you need a few moments of quiet with yourself. Truly the intimate knowledge of landscape. It's a pity indeed to travel and not get this essential sense of landscape values. You do not need a sixth sense for it. It is there if you just close your eyes and breathe softly through your nose. You will hear the whispered message for all landscapes. Ask the same question in the same whisper. I am watching you. Are you watching yourself in me?
and most travelers hurry too much. Ten minutes of this sort of quiet inner identification will give you the notion of the Greek landscape which you could not get in 20 years of studying ancient Greek texts. But having got it, you will at once get all the rest. The key is there, so to speak, for you to turn. Of course, you cannot arrange to be initiated through a travel agency. You would have to reside and work your way in through the ancient crust, a tough one, of daily life. It is here that the travel writer stakes his claims, for writers each seem to have a personal landscape of the heart which beckons them. Well, the landscape is so various. Um, one, talks, one talks about it because one can do nothing else when one is here, but why isn't it Spain? Why isn't it Italy? It isn't, you know, it's something quite different. What is it, ultraviolet ray? No paint has got it, and we, all we word makers, are very dissatisfied with our renderings of it. It's not that quite. It's a mystery, and let it remain a mystery so that you keep coming here to find out what the hell it's about. Can it remain a mystery? Oh, yes, certainly. All the big elements, earth, air, water, fire, in the Heraclitean sense, are still here, and they remain very big mysteries. Solitude is built in here, and you're surrounded by it, not only nature's like that, but when you see the monks here, you realize it's positive. In other words, it's not a negative quality. You're not locked up in a cell. You come out to meet it. The monkishness is not a withdrawal from life. It's rather plunging into it. And I suppose the heart of life must be really quite empty. And the word is marvelous in Greek, monaxia, loneliness. It also comes from monk, too. The quality of quietness in the islands is um, is uh, marvelous because it's slightly a bit sinister. I wonder, uh, are we picking up that susurrus of wind in the trees here? Well, you hear that at night and so on. Uh, you're on the key vive, rather like you are on safari, because it could be a lion breathing, and it's grease breathing. It's just that little touch of anxiety which gives the real quality of this island. Listen. And that reminds me, it's siesta time, afternoon. The whole countryside folds up like a flower during the midday hours. The self-respecting husbandman and townee alike prefer a carefully shuttered room to the intensity, the silence and the brilliance of the southern afternoons. It is a weird time of day when everything seems to succumb to the silence. Everything except the tireless cicada. It's the hour when Pan takes his rest. Hence, the haunting fear of the tree's shade. For no laborer will sleep under the shade of an old tree, or one that is supposed to have grown a spirit. For it is here, in the shadows of trees, at crossroads, by running water, that Pan's assistants, the contemporary Nereids, lie in waiting. patron saint is called Saint Spiridion, but the island is really the saint and the saint is the island, for nearly all the male children are named after him. Here in the church of the same name, Venice and Byzance compete in silver and brass, in bronze and in iron. It's fascinating to watch him being bargained with because, in fact, most of the praying is done on a strictly bargaining nature. I'm giving you a couple of candles. Now you come on, show a leg and get me out of this mess I'm in. That tone of voice, which is uh, not what we call prayer, which is beseeching and propitiating, etc., etc., 
it's rough stuff. And he does come up, he cures plagues, he does almost everything. He's dispersed fleets, he's dispersed chicken pox, he's dispersed children, he's done everything. It's most amazing. I'm very fond of him, and I always carry a small amulet with me, and when I'm in trouble in Los Angeles, I always put it up and pray to it, and I say, listen, you old dog, get me out of this one, and I promise you, when I get back, you'll have a golden arm. Lawrence Durrell and his wife Nancy took a house in the north of the island. Here, at the shrine of Santa Zenius, Durrell wrote his first major novel, The Black Book. Because of censorship, it could not be published in England. However, due to the encouragement and support of his publisher, T.S. Eliot, and his friend, Henry Miller, it came out in Paris in 1938. It was finally published in Britain in 1973. <laughs> Parallel to the rather rocky life I was living was a frightfully intense interior life, which was centered more or less on trying to shape myself into some sort of artist, which is harder than you may think. Other countries may offer you discoveries in manners, or law, or landscape, but Greece offers you something harder, the discovery of yourself. My wife and I spent several summers quite alone here, the two of us, in this little bay, under the protection of the saint, who I must say has always been very kind. St. Arsenius, good morning. After so many years, I've come to ask you for another favor. Otherwise, he might muck up our filming. I'll ask him in Greek to lay off. Aius Arsenius, namas voithiste na kanome mia kanidulia na dinelava. It looks all right. Looks a bit like Freud. The icon was washed up here in the middle of a storm, and it was found floating in the bay. Somebody came down, a peasant looking after his olives, and found the icon, took it to the priest, and the priest decreed that there should be a little shrine built here for him. He doesn't seem to figure in the list of saints, but then there are quite a lot who don't. They're local saints, spirits of place. It's my second birthplace. You know the... Um, the old Indian notion that one's born twice, once physically, and then once you sort of wake up to reality. I think it's particularly true of poets, or of writers, let's say. Uh, here, it's, a, it's, quite, it's exactly the place where I finished off the Black Book and got my first poems together, and where I sort of discovered my own voice, in a way. It, it astonished me more than anyone else, but it proved also that I could write, which it, well, hadn't been clear before. You see, my other books were Jolly nice anthologies of all the writers I admired, you know, two pages of Huxley, one page of Robert Graves, a bit of Richard Aldington. Uh, I was skillful, I was abil, I was able, but that wasn't quite what I was after. I wasn't me. And in the Black Book, I am me, for better or for worse. You must imagine this sort of extraordinary luck of a young man who comes to a place as remote as this, cuts himself off completely, to find that his editor was T.S. Eliot, uh, that an anonymous writer called Henry Miller was anxious to see his work and to praise it indeed. But it took an awful long time until you actually could live off your craft. Oh yes, 25 years you can say. But uh, that's very normal. I've had to lurk about in the BBC and as a school teacher and as a, as a false diplomat and so on and so forth in order to keep uh, the bread coming in. Did this make you bitter? Uh, well, I tried, uh, the point is it was a good waste of time in some ways, but I kept it an open notebook. I took uh, an example from Stendhal, who never wasted a trick. And it all came in very useful, because some sometime later when I did the quartet, I needed diplomats. And you know, when you haven't actually seen one uh, uh, close to, it's very hard to, uh, to fake one, you know. Most people um, uh, find it very, very difficult uh, to to get a reality. If you've never lunched at Buckingham Palace, it's awfully difficult to describe. You know, you have to fudge it. Well, I have fortunately seen diplomats very, very close, and I realized that if you poked them with fingers, finger, sawdust came out, and you could get that impression when writing about them absolutely perfectly. But you have to be close. <laughs> Three 
ya pez, ya pez, ya pez, ya bolotica. Hey, ria pez, ya pez, ya bolotica. Ya la sata, la sakimu, si se tome rakimu. Why do you keep our villages always dressed in black? Salasa le vendo pictra, salasa to soyero, o puto cornea putro, y tar mirisuto nero. Sea, you youth swallower, o poison bearing element sea, who makes our island folk always to be wearing their black? Have you not had enough of it yet, sea, in all this long time? with all the bodies of the young you have swallowed up down into your insatiable maw. You wrote a lot of poetry also on Corfu, didn't yes, you? Yes, a very great deal. Not all of it very good. I had great battles with Eliot about it. But I must say, his, he, if I have any little slender reputation, it's due to his wise choice and his refusal to bow down when I wanted to slip a bad poem in. Was it a great conflict between the writer and the poet? Not really. It's all, it's all one and the same thing, because in the absolute analysis, in the final analysis, writing doesn't interest me at all. What I wanted to do was to grow up. Writing was just uh, like a punch bag, which happened to be at hand. But it could have been fly fishing. You can grow up anywhere, I now realize. You could do, you can achieve a little bit of uh, information about yourself through any medium. That's where the Japanese are so wise. They don't bore you with metaphysics. They say, take up sword play, learn arranging flowers, do something physical. You could be a boxer and be a hero, too. Was writing easier then? No, it's never, it's never very easy. You have to give yourself a sort of artificial nervous breakdown. And then you communicate the fear, the horror, uh, or the suspense, or whatever, to your reader. But if you're flat, the stuff you're writing tends to be like flat ginger beer. And the reading of it is flat, too. It's a very mysterious thing, because you're passing like a current, or you're passing a current along a wire, so to speak, with your writing, through the eyes of somebody else, and through his appreciating mind, his soul, if you like. So you, get, you, you have to register a certain magnetic wavelength that somebody else can grab. Because fundamentally, you, in touching on your own terrors and on your own neuroses, you are liberating them, and you're vicariously liberating your reader, too. That's why he finds this magnetic or this splendid or that the other, because it touches his own particular terrors, horrors, neuroses, or whatever. So that's really the secret, I think.
At night, the fishing boats put out. They carry great carbide flares to attract the fish to the nets. And soon the dark bulk of the Albanian shadow opposite will be studded with their jeweled fires. Then everything dies down suddenly and the color washes back into the sky. The evening light mellows very softly into its range of warm lemon tones, pressing among the close bunches of the ripening grapes. The cicadas are dying out, station after station closing down. In the east, the color is washing out of the world, leaving room for the great copper-colored moon, which will rise over the pyrus. It is the magic hour between two unrealized states of being, the day world expiring in its last hot tones of amber and lemon, and the night world gathering with its ink blue shadows and silver moonlight. Endearing and seducing moon, the sky's curvature like an impress of an embrace while she rises, as if in one's own throat, so pure, so glittering. The blue waters of the lagoon invent moonlight and play it back in fountains of crystal. And now the stars are shining down, frost blown and taut upon this pure Euclidean surface. On the edge of the mirror, a wind comes, and the whole of heaven stirs and trembles. In 1939, Lawrence Dahl left Corfu. Working as a press officer at the British Embassy and as a teacher for the British Council, he spent much of his time traveling throughout the Peloponnese and the many Greek islands. I'm sure you can feel, either in picture or in yourself, the enormous contrast between the voluptuousness, the Garden of Eden qualities of Corfu, where we've come from. We've plunged into the Aegean now. Rock, water, light, air, we're much nearer to ancient Greece here. And when you cross the, ma the mainland to the first Greek island from Turkey, the first notes of the bouzouki that come out across the water is as persistent and as, uh, uh, as exacerbating as the cicada. I tell you, you're back in that country. Thank you. 
Oh, that, uh, that donkey bell reminds me. You know, f uh, first of all, all the ancient Greek sites are now modern Greek monasteries. In other words, the actual fanes have not changed. M and so many of the beliefs have been transported owing to the fact that the language has changed so little. Our languages have changed so enormously in a few hundred years. Greek has remained almost constant and, uh, since the Attic grammar. And language ra rather dictates like landscape, attitudes, do you see? Attitudes to water, to light. There are still nymphs and goddesses. They may be baptized with a name like Sophia or something a bit more modern, but the ancient animistic beliefs are still enormously strong. Uh, and you can't get away from them. And I think any, it's one of the charms of Greece that one does feel that the ancient gods are there, sometimes under another name, but in the same monastery, doing a different service. It's, it's reassuring for us, like the donkey. It's terribly reassuring. It's the continuity. It's what the French would call the perennity, perennité des choses. Uh, it's the long-lastingness of essential beliefs anchored in the land, which seems so wonderful, nourishing, good. In the, in the old days, of course, the place was riddled with spells Nice, no? Hmm? He, he, he's warning me, that old guy. Who is the local saint? I don't know. He's warning me not to be too loose about superstitions, you see. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll go, get our fortunes told in Crete now. I, I, uh, uh, I think I can lay my hands on a fortune teller. They're getting rarer and rarer, and superstition is getting less and less, uh, owing, of course, to modern civilization. And perhaps it's wise that it should be so. I can't tell, really. But much is done by magic here still, and every island has its healer. Και το σε λέει, γυτάστε τα δυο καλά δερφάσια και κλέτε και τρινάστε του Θεού παραπονάτε. It's a verse that she learned from her grandmother, which helped her in her healing. And it's a long uh, lyrical poem by going to the mountain and finding two brothers, one of whom was sick and one of whom was sound, and of, of catching turtles. And it's a medieval poem, obviously, in its form. And uh, the act of learning this, of memorizing it, appears to have been her initiation into the art of healing. Everywhere the historic memories echo on, drone on like the bees that once droned in the tomb of Agamemnon.
might ask what contact could exist between the refined and isolated life of ancient Greece and the haphazard life of the modern Greek living in the shadow of Europe, yet the Odyssey describes with delightful and poignant accuracy the modern Greeks. It is a portrait of a nation which rings clear today as when it was written. Chronologically, we are separated from Ulysses by hundreds of years, yet we dwell in his shadow. Ulysses can only be ratified as a historical figure with the help of these fishermen who sit in front of the smoky tavern waiting for the wind to change. As you get to know Europe slowly, tasting the wines, the cheeses, and the characters of the different countries, you begin to realize that the important determinant of any culture is the spirit of place. Just as one particular vineyard will always give you a special wine with a discernible characteristic, so a country will always give you the same type of culture, will express itself through the human being just as it does through the wildflowers. So long as people keep getting born Greek or French or Italian, their culture will bear the unmistakable signature of the place. The distinction between matter and spirit, which we make, which is essential to our philosophy and which has led to our materialist advances, uh, wasn't strictly an ancient Greek foible fo fo at all. For them, the material world was, uh, was as much magical as the magical world. The noumenon and the phenomenon were, were perfectly mixed. But we've been uh, spoiled in a sense because we've been brought up to believe that uh, facts aren't dreams. And of course they are. We've sacrificed a great deal on the spiritual side, but on the material side, there has never been, I think, uh, um, a civilization uh, so enormously rich in its matter. The mystery is how, why it's so ugly. Because we have at our disposal 5,000 times more than King Solomon ever had to build a temple with, and where the hell is our architecture coming from? It must be coming from these little halitosis-ridden souls. Because after all, it's only an exteriorization of, uh, of what you feel. A minute you start drawing, you start drawing, you are uncoiling the contents of your subconscious. The landscape of Greece has such pure, nude chastity, it doesn't ask for applause. The light seems to come off the heart of some Buddhistic blue stone or flower, always changing, but serene and pure, and lotion soft on the iris. How important are roots for a writer? I think they are rather important. You need a fulcrum, really, 
and in my sense, I think I rather think I've been uh, hunting for roots or putting them down in various places to sustain the sustain the tree of my work, if you like. Uh, and circumstance uh, has pushed me out of countries which would have been very fruitful to me. And probably my own malaise comes from the fact that I'm deracinated. I have no real landscape. And my attempts to, uh, to evaluate landscape may well be like a bird trying to build a nest of some sort and find a home. But how do you acquire this sense for the value of landscape? By residence, by attachment, I think. I mean, uh, the wine presumably likes the soil it grows in and doesn't like another. And I think when you get to a place, the first thing you think is, gosh, I wouldn't care to live here. But once you find yourself thinking, I wouldn't mind dying here, then you found it. For example, look at this little olive. It's very recently planted. It likes its earth so much, it started to bear prematurely. Um, that's identified properly. And it's in that root sense that I meant it. Dominant in a landscape full of richer greens, the olive is for the peasant both a good servant and a hard master. Look at the olive trees, how immeasurably they are enriched by the poetic symbolism which surrounds them, the platonic idea of the olives, the symbol for everything enriched by the domestic earth and private virtue. Then again, the word is used for those small dark moles which women sometimes have on their faces or throats. And then it is only poetic justice to observe that every saint's shrine has lamps which are replenished by the offerings of the poor who have slaved nearly the whole year round in varying weather to gather the yield of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Though the olive is an undependable friend, its role never varies. Dipped into it, the coarse peasant bread tastes dense and foul, yet the children of the fishermen have warm brown skins and dazzling white teeth. And of course, everything is cooked in it. <laughs> <laughs> the whole Mediterranean, the sculptures, the palms, the gold beads, the bearded heroes, the wine, the ideas, the ships, the moonlight, the winged gorgons, the bronze men, the philosophers, all of it seems to rise in the sour, pungent taste of these black olives between the teeth, a taste older than meat, older than wine, a taste as old as cold water. It can be said that there's almost too much richness in you. Poetry, novel, travel writing, journalism, painting. Yes, I know. I know it's, it's, it's a charge which I, I um, find difficulty in refuting. I, I know I tend to overwrite. But uh, fundamentally, I write the sort of things that I want to read, uh, not what the other man wants to read. Uh, and uh, I'm satisfied because I'm using the language, which is a very rich and flexible one, uh, on, maximum, on maximum spread, so to speak. Do you think as a writer one has a sort of unlimited well from which one can draw? Or are there five, six basic characters which you always draw upon and who reappear? Well, inevitably they do. You do tend to go over your own obsessions and your own experiences. There's a certain amount of repetition. But what is in inexhaustible is the language you're writing in, and you can always do things with that. T.S. Eliot once said to me, there's only one thing to say, but we must find as many ways of saying it as possible, and that means we really must try different forms. With age, our inhibition to write stronger than when one was young and just... No, but it's, it's, uh, the danger is it's much easier. You're technically so accomplished that you can float, you can freewheel, you can careen, and you're not putting a punch behind it. And it isn't uh, immediately visible that, but you jolly well know that this book isn't, isn't quite um, as deep as it should be. The German invasion in 1941 forced Dara to take refuge in Egypt, where he collected the material for his Alexandria Quartet. But Justine, Balthazar, Mount Olive, and Claire had not yet been written. 
After the war, he returned to Greece, and life in Rhodes provided him with the background for his second island book, Reflections on a Marine Venus. If you should have the luck to approach Rhodes as perhaps one should, through the soft yellow tones of a June nightfall, you would undoubtedly imagine it to be some great sea animal asleep in the water. Nestling in the natural amphitheater where once stood the white buildings and temples of the ancient town, the Crusader fortress with its encircling walls and crumbling turrets looks for all the world like a town in pen and ink, situated upon the margins of some illuminated manuscript, the medieval dream of a fortress called Rhodes, which the mist has invented for you. Rhodes' history might have been summed up in the words sea power, gold, neutrality. Both by geography and temperament, Rhodes lay just outside the storm centers of trouble, and at every turn in her ancient history, she took advantage of the fact. Little enough now remains save the chain of ruined forts and the names of famous battles. But one still runs across songs left behind by the Crusaders, living on side by side with the belief in a freshwater goddess whose antiquity stretches back beyond Plato. Who could ever hope to pin down, to circumscribe the charms of a resident goddess when she was raised that sunny morning from the damp crypt in which she had lain hidden, when the packing case which held her had been broken open, when the pulleys finally raised her out of the darkness, which of us could fail to recognize the presiding genius of the place? Well, here she is again, the great lady, the Aphrodite of Rhodes, the marine Venus who cast a very pretty shadow over my dreams for two years in this blissful island. The archaeologists say that she's an Aphrodite of the Pudica type and that she was found in the ruins of the fortress when they were digging it. But the fishermen of Rhodes have always believed that she was dragged up in their nets. And she certainly has been a long time in the sea. She's been sucked like a stone jujube. Interesting mark on her her breast excites some wonder as it's a kind of beauty mark, an artificial one. My wife, who was no archaeologist, suggested that it was, a, it was a love bite caused by a kiss from Zeus. But here again, the scientists dryly intervene, and they tell me that it's a watch that's, that's fallen down into the sea on top of her as she lay in the water, and that the iron gradually burnt itself into her flesh and seared it. In a sense, what passed between us was rather suspect because it was rather literary. But uh, I liked her for her defects, which is the way you go about liking real women. Oh, God, I, I do hope that doesn't sound too Sir Kenneth Clark. So long as we are in this place, we shall not be free from her. It's as if our thoughts must be forever stained by some of her own dark illumination the preoccupation of a stone woman inherited from a past whose greatest hopes and ideals fell to ruins. Behind and through her, the whole idea of Greece glows sadly, like some broken capital, like the shattered pieces of a graceful jar, like the torso of a statue to hope. Through her, we have learned to see Greece with the inner eye, not as a collection of battered vestiges left over from cultures long since abandoned, but as something ever-present and ever-renewed, the symbol married to the object prime, so that a plough, a jar, a millstone, 
are extended beyond themselves into an eternality they enjoyed only with the furniture of all good poetry. In the blithe air of Rhodes, she has provided us with a vicarious sense of continuity, not only with the past, but also with the future. For surely, history's evaluations are wrong in speaking of civilized and barbaric ages succeeding or preceding one another. Surely they've always coexisted. Surely one is the measure of the other. Time is always aspiring to a dance measure which will entangle the two in a dance, dissolve their opposition. The radiance of that worn stone figure carries the message to us so clearly. In Rhodes, Darrell worked as a public information officer. He ran several Greek and Turkish newspapers. He and his second wife, Eve, lived in a little house the Villa Cleobulus at the edge of the Turkish cemetery. When uh, first I came here in 1945, everything was moving right. The war was finished. Europe was waking up. I was enormously in love. And after the sort of stalemate of Egypt, to come here and have relatively light duties to do, and this marvelous landscape to play with. And there was an old mufti who died last year who presided over it who was rather a delightful old rogue, and we were very good friends. But I'm sorry he's not here, he's not present now to say hello. He would have loved it. He was a tremendous show-off. Uh, he told me that uh, at the age of 90, he'd just succeeded in making a baby, and he was pleased as punch. He was what my brother would call frightfully chuffed. The cemetery itself is very evocative, and there's always a very touching poetry about these male and female tombs. These trees send off their leaves like little propellers that come whizzing down. No, it's a beautiful place, and it still smells good of eucalyptus. I don't know what it is about Islam, um, the kind of ruthless logic of it, the uh, rigidity of it gives it a certain poetry, uh, which other softer religions, kinder ones, lack often. It hasn't got the melancholy of Christian uh, cemeteries, which has an absolutely abstract sort of beauty. Only three or four times did I strike uh, really uh, fruitful and happy places where I enjoyed a spell of, uh, of, uh, of real bliss consciously. Normally, bliss is something that happened when one didn't recognize it. You remember about it afterwards. But here, one lived it actually consciously, day by day, and it was delicious, like the honey. Lindos is one of the three ancient cities which once dominated the politics and government of the island. I would like our own idle history of conversations to open up like a sally port and throw into relief the many colored background of the island's own history so that the landscape may be evoked before the eyes of a reader who is not free to touch with his own hands or to feel the waves of sunlight heat the rocks upon which he sits. It is as if you had been leaning against a door leading to a poem when suddenly it swung open, letting you stumble directly into the heart of it. Lindos, under the sweetness of its decoration, is like a trumpet call, beaten out in gold leaf and vibrating across the blue air of time. Its beauty is of a scrupulous Aegean order and perfect of its kind. The narrow streets rise and fall like music, a dazzling glitter of plaster and whitewash, so that if you half close your eyes, you might imagine that Lindos reflected back the snowy reflections of a passing cloud.
Nothing can intrude upon the singing beauty of this ancient town uncovered by the spade of the archaeologist. In such a city, you find yourself thinking, if such a landscape out of time was not able to strike the right chord in the human heart by its appeals to clemency, truth, and intellectual order in life, what chance have we with our unburied cities to do so? I was, at the end of the war, very much in need of some kind of reassurance, reaffirmation of my own direction and things and so on and so forth. And I spent a weekend up there alone, really, uh, camping. Um, a sort of investigation of myself. The war had finished and we wanted to know what the hell we were going to do with ourselves and the peace. And there I had a kind of a feeling of confirmation that my own direction, though selfish, was okay. Do you have sometimes the feeling that life makes a tremendous leap forward and things have drastically changed? Yes, you kind of, you hit on, a, you hit on, like train switching points. It's usually done by other people. There isn't a word, good word in English, but the French have a super word for it. It's called le déclic. And it means the intellectual sudden awakening of intuition, which branches you off on a new, new path. You said that love is the most important thing in your life. Is it more important than writing? Oh, a million times. Writing is nothing. Nothing at all. If you had the power to change the pattern of life, would you change it? No, I prefer to, uh, I, I, I prefer to suppose that there's some reason about it which has to be respected. In other words, sometimes even in writing, you have to write down things that you yourself don't quite understand. In other words, you have to believe in them. And then afterwards, you, you're surprised to find they have meaning. Where do you think this reason comes from? Oh, God. God's backside. Why do you try to appear as someone who isn't serious, whose writing should not be taken serious? Is that an act of defense? Oh, no, 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 no. It's much more important than that. Um, I, uh, I, I hate to quote myself, but I, I don't remember it having been said better. Um, life is too important not to be taken lightly. How about art? Well, that's à la portée. It's up to you. Art is for arting, art is for farting, you know. I mean, it must be taken absolutely straight. Straight from the bottle, I mean. The div bouteille, the rabelais. An art is really loving, finally. All these things are secondary. You can love right, everything comes right. Nothing is ever solved finally. In every age, from every angle, we are facing the same set of natural phenomena. Moonlight, death, religion, laughter, fear, we make idolatrous attempts to enclose them in a conceptual frame, and all the time they change under our very noses. I swim for a moment or two, and then turn on my back and watch the sky through wet eyelashes. And lying there, on that resilient, tideless meadow of water, I see in my mind's eye the whole panorama of our Greek life, made up of a thousand different scenes and ages, all turning before me now as if on the slow turntable of the four seasons. It's good to see places where one has been happy in the past, to see them after many years and in different circumstances. Ahead of us, the night gathers, and Greece begins to fall into the unresponding sea from which only memory can rescue her. Other islands, other futures, not, I think, after one has lived with the marine Venus. The wound she gives, one must carry to the world's end. Mir tu stala so dernista la sakimu ke fer to pula kimu Mir tu stala so dernista la sakimu ke fer to pula kimu 
θάλασσα κι αρμυρό νερό, να σε ξεχάσω δε μπορώ. Κι η κοπελιά, η κοπελιά είναι μικρή θάλασσα κι η η κοπελιά, η κοπελιά είναι μικρή θάλασσα κοιμή και δεν της πάρτα μαύρα θαλασσονούμε για σένα ξημερώνουμε και δεν της πάρτα μαύρα θαλασσονούμε για σένα ξημερώνουμε Θάλασσα κι αρμυρό νερό, 